In this lesson, we are going to get into our very first offense, which is homicide. Now, homicide itself can be both lawful and unlawful. And our primary focus in this regard would be in relation to unlawful homicide. If I am to give you a, a few examples on what lawful homicide might be, for instance, where there are executioners in place for uh, certain punishments to be dealt with, that is lawful homicide. Where in the case of self-defense, which in itself is a defense itself, where all elements of murder or, for example, homicide might have been accomplished still, the defense is applicable, the person will be acquitted, and therefore it's not considered as unlawful killing of a human being. The defense of self-defense also extends to, for instance, where someone is trying to kill uh, another and you intervene in order to protect that other person. Now, having considered this initial notion, our primary focus rests in relation to unlawful homicide. Now, in most LLB syllabuses, homicide itself is divided into murder and manslaughter. So, in order to begin our lesson proper, we'll look at one of the most famous, or should I say infamous, of crimes, the most heinous of crimes, in fact, which is murder. Now, murder itself can be considered as the unlawful killing of a human being with the intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. What does this mean? Now, it's important to note that even in relation to manslaughter, the actus reus or the physical act itself remains the same with both murder and manslaughter. Thus, in relation to murder, the actus reus which you can consider in relation to Maloney, a case which is available in your case summaries, which I urge you to have a look at, refers to the unlawful killing of a human being. Moreover, if we consider the latter notion, or the mens rea, the mental element, which can be seen in Vickers, also a case available in your case summaries, is the killing must have occurred with the intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. Now, we see in Saunders that grievous bodily harm has been equated to even serious harm. You might be thinking why exactly this is important and why we must consider the wording itself to be properly constituted. The reason being is, from an examination standpoint, most problem questions posed to you would not deal with the exact definitions of many crimes. For instance, in the case of murder, you have to prove that D, or the defendant, unlawfully killed the victim with the intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. Now, the wording itself in a question scenario might specify that the defendant intended serious harm. Now, in a position such as this, it is always advisable to cite a case such as Saunders, as I have mentioned here, in order to justify serious harm as having the same effect or considered by court to have the same effect as grievous bodily harm. Now, before we move on to our next section, which is manslaughter in relation to homicide, it must be noted that murder itself has a component of voluntary manslaughter, which is the actus reus. Now, considering manslaughter as a lesser degree of a crime than murder is simply to denote that the mental element was not in place. What is not in dispute is the unlawful killing of a human being. As in, in relation to murder or manslaughter, there has been an unlawful killing of a human being. As in, the actus reus component has been fulfilled. The only difference is that the mens rea element in relation to murder and voluntary as well as involuntary manslaughter is not complete. As in, the intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm cannot be proven beyond reasonable doubt. Having said that, we'll have a look at manslaughter. Now, the very first area that we are going to look at is voluntary manslaughter. Now, the difference, as I mentioned a moment ago, is that the actus reus is the same as murder. However, the mens rea or the mental element of the crime has not been fulfilled. If you recall in our introduction, I mentioned that two particular defenses apply in relation to murder which is loss of self-control and diminished responsibility. If a person pleads either loss of control or diminished responsibility, 
for a charge of murder and if he's successful in this defense his charge will be mitigated to voluntary manslaughter by way of either loss of control or diminished responsibility now it is worthwhile noting that murder as in homicide itself is primarily a common law offense as in there being no definition in statute both loss of control and diminished responsibility in relation to voluntary manslaughter can actually be found under the Coroners and Justice Act of 2009 as well as the Homicide Act of 1957 so i urge you to have a look at both of these acts in relation to the definitions themselves it's a very good example of where such a heinous crime itself has been defined within statute which is within legislature so first of all let's have a look at what elements must be fulfilled in order for a defendant to successfully plead loss of control there are several qualifying triggers firstly there must have been fear of serious violence intended towards the defendant secondly there must have been a sense of being seriously wronged or there might be a situation where these two are combined and act as triggers themselves now you might be concerned as to for instance the second point where if he had a sense of being seriously wronged that it pretty much equates to a anger trigger as in his anger itself triggered him to act in the way that he did but however this also you must remember is beyond reasonable doubt as in the burden of proof since if the person if the defendant himself is for instance a habitually angry person if he is known to have fits of rage this particular trigger might not have occurred and therefore the defense might fail moreover there are a few limitations as well to these qualifying triggers for instance if the defendant relies on the uh, fear of violence it cannot be held to be a valid defense if that violence was created by the defendant himself moreover if the defendant committed an act due to sexual infidelity for instance it cannot be held and also if the defendant incited the situation if he was part and parcel of creating the atmosphere and the situation in play then he cannot be considered to be seriously wronged and therefore again the defense cannot be held now it's worthwhile noting that loss of self control is an evolutionary derivative of provocation which was a defense prior to it now in provocation it must be noted that uh the sex as well as the age of the defendant was not taken into consideration but in relation to loss of self control these are also factors that permit that are permitted rather by court when the defense is uh being called upon by the defendant now as you can clearly see while voluntary manslaughter itself is a mitigatory offense to that of murder it cannot be accomplished as in the mens rea element cannot be mitigated so simply unless the qualifying triggers are achieved and the limitations are also overtaken by the defendant the limitations themselves suggest that it's quite subjective in nature at times since for instance as i mentioned earlier if the defendant himself portrays certain habitual characteristics he might not be able to rely on the defense itself now conversely if a defendant were to plead diminished responsibility there would be no need for qualifying triggers as that which is needed in the case of loss of self control now it's interesting to note that in relation to diminished responsibility it's a defense that can be raised by the defendant as well as one that can be raised conversely by the prosecution as well what do i mean by this now on the one hand when the defendant raises uh the defense of diminished responsibility when he has been charged with murder the burden of proof itself is on a balance of probability now this is quite a contrast to that of beyond reasonable doubt being the burden of proof generally in relation to criminal matters on the other hand if the defendant has raised an insanity defense which if you recall the introduction would mean that an acquittal a qualified acquittal which would reprimand the defendant into psychiatric care the prosecution can bring up diminished responsibility in essence what the prosecution will try to or attempt to do is to commit the defendant to a charge of manslaughter or voluntary manslaughter rather than seeing him acquitted with a mandatory psychiatric evaluation now in this latter case the burden of proof is beyond reasonable doubt and it falls squarely on the prosecution now the point to note here is where a defense is being raised by the defendant 
he has to prove on a balance of probabilities whereas a prosecution invariably abide by uh, the burden of proof being beyond reasonable doubt now if we consider diminished responsibility in context with insanity as i mentioned earlier there is somewhat of a difference for instance insanity the defendant did not know what he was doing he was not in control whatsoever but in relation to diminished responsibility the defendant knew what he was doing but couldn't restrain himself so he couldn't control himself although he was aware of his actions and perhaps even the consequences as well whereas insanity it was completely out of his control and he was unaware that he was doing such an act in the first place now unlike voluntary manslaughter involuntary manslaughter does not have any component of the mens rea as seen in murder for instance as the intention to kill or cause grievous bodily harm there are three main aspects that we must consider in relation to involuntary manslaughter it can be committed by way of gross negligence now this is in relation to mostly medical negligence cases ones which you will come across Uh, when you go into the second or third years in relation to the law of tort now once you have a look at adamarco and levin you'll get a better understanding of how exactly this crime can be committed gross negligence usually occurs when there is a duty of care by one party presumably the defendant in relation to the victim there was a breach and it caused the death of the victim conversely you have recklessness as can be seen in lida also available in your case summaries interestingly constructive involuntary manslaughter deals with situations where there's an unlawful dangerous situation created which evidently caused the death of the victim now cases like watson and church illustrate clearly on what requirements must be fulfilled in order for a defendant to be found guilty in relation to involuntary manslaughter that was quite a succinct overview of homicide in relation to both murder and voluntary as well as involuntary manslaughter next we will have a look at simple non fatal offenses against a person or common assault hi my name is shavin bandar naik thanks a lot for watching this video on youtube For the complete course, make sure you click the link on the left. Also, for an exclusive discount to YouTube viewers, enter the coupon code YouTube at the course page. All the very best with your studies and good luck with your exams. See you in the next lesson.